Folks, we've been talking about the kingdom. Jesus came to this world to reestablish the kingdom of God. And we read, and especially in the book of Matthew, particularly chapter 13, which is where we've been, we've been talking about the kingdom parables, where Jesus begins every parable, and there are plenty of them, saying the kingdom of heaven is like. And he paints a picture for you of what the, the kingdom of God is, is like now and is like it's going to be when one day, and uh, we're into the kingdom. But every kingdom has got a couple of things. Every kingdom, first of all, has got a king. And we know who the king of this kingdom is. But every kingdom, in addition to a king, has got the king's principles. And it's out of these principles that the kingdom puts itself into operation. These principles of the king are the things that are adding value and worth and are the, the priority of the people in the kingdom. They want to fulfill the will of the king who has put these principles into, into place. Now we look at some of these kingdom parables, we look at some of these kingdom principles and have been for a, a little while. But uh, I want to take you to Matthew chapter 13 today. And uh, it's a build on on a, on a kingdom parable that we spoke about the other week where we said the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. It's so small and yet when it grows, it grows into this enormous tree and many people find shelter and welfare under this tree. Well, if you read after that, and I'm going to read them both to you because it's a very short reading, you'll read the next parable that I'd like to talk about. This is what he says, Matthew 13, verse 31. He told them another parable. Jesus is on a roll here. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and planted it in his field. Though it is the smallest of all the seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree. So the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all through the dough. Now you all know that what the yeast does, it's yeast that gives the bread its body. It's yeast that gives the bread its volume. And you don't need much yeast amongst a whole lot of, of the, the, the flour and all the eggs and all the other stuff to raise the loaf up. If you don't put yeast into it, you get that flat bread, which is also very nice, but it's not bread. It's just flat bread because there's no dough in it, no yeast in it, but it's the yeast that is so minuscule and yet it has an enormous effect and uh, the repercussions are seen as a result in the bread. Very similar to the parable of the, the one that we spoke about, the one of, the, of the, uh, the tree and the seed that was planted, another seed, this tiny little seed, came this great big tree. Jesus is trying to paint a picture for us here. And I hope that we'll be able to take that picture and look at it from a global point of view and then look at it more from a personal point of view today. Jesus, people, is talking about the church in a global sense. He's talking about that which is so small and started with just a handful of people has now grown and has now, now invaded the whole world and that wherever you go, you're likely to find that there will be a church of some shape or form over there. And it's interesting to see that, you know, in the course of church history, how it is that church has not always done well. There have been some things that have happened that have embarrassed the church, and we have not done well. But uh, on a whole, in the big picture, there is no movement that has ever taken place across the world, no movement that has affected the world for good over the course of human history as has the church. The prophecy, in a sense, that Jesus spoke here about the seed that would grow into a great tree, the prophecy about that little piece of yeast that would be put into and would grow this great big loaf of, of bread, as a sense, has been fulfilled and is continuing to be fulfilled. But one of the kingdom principles that we look at here is that the little affects the lot. Now, I'm using the word the lot at the end deliberately. It's not the, this little affects a lot. It doesn't. It affects the lot. A little bit of the church in the world has affected the lot of the world around us. 
This yeast, however, can be a picture. And if you go to Google it or go and look in your concordance or whatever and study yeast in the Bible, you see that there are two very opposing sort of connotations to it. The first one is the yeast that is evil. And it says the yeast of the Pharisees, which is the wicked teaching of, of people who want to lull you into thinking that the law is the way to, to get to God. It's not. It's just the yeast of the Pharisees. It's a false teaching. And there is false teaching out there that is, does the same thing as the good yeast, which raises the loaf. This other one raises bad bread. It makes bad and evil things take place. It's the evil yeast. And it's kind of like sin, because sin has a bad effect on things. You all know that. You know, we often say one of the principles of life, we, we, talk, about a, a, we talk about the fact that good and evil cannot be compatible. They cannot be together. We talk about the fact that less is more. That uh, we talk about the fact that you don't, uh, you don't despise small beginnings. We realize that a little affects the lot. When it comes to the issues of sin, Jesus was very radical when he spoke about it. He wasn't being literal, but he was certainly being very radical. He says, if your eye offends you, pluck it out. It is better to go into the kingdom of heaven with one eye than it is with two. That's radical thinking. He's not suggesting we all pluck our eyes out when we do evil things and we look at bad stuff, but he's just trying to illustrate to you the radical nature of what it means to deal with the sin, this leaven of sin, that a little bit can affect a lot. Ask people who have messed up lives, and ask me, I can testify to this as well, that a little of evil can lead to a lot of pain because the yeast is small, but the effect is enormous. That's for another sermon. But today we're talking about the yeast that is good. I want to talk to you about the yeast that is good. Now, there are, are two examples that we've seen here. We've spoken about the mustard seed. We've spoken about the yeast. But I, I want to talk about the, 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 the speaking of this growth and influence. Two things. That from the inception of the church, nobody gave it a chance. The Romans in the first century thought it would just dry up and blow away after Jesus had died. And the disciples got together and thought, oh, they're just gonna, they won't last long. We'll just persecute them for a little bit and then they will dry up and they'll blow away just like every other little sect has done. We'll just do the same thing to these people who call themselves Christ followers. Well, they tried that. And then at this little church that went from a little bit more than 12 disciples suddenly grew to enormous, enormous proportions. In fact, it infected and affected the entire Roman nation. Within 40 years, the then known world of was pretty much mostly governed by Rome had been infiltrated by the church all over the place. And so when we look at these different things of, of how the yeast has blossomed, how the yeast has grown, how the yeast has caused the church to grow. It's so true. Go pretty much anywhere in the world, people, and you're going to see that the church is more than likely going to be there. Look at all the languages of the world. Most languages of the world have now been interpreted into the Bible. There's only a handful still yet to go. The church has truly fulfilled this thing. It's kind of like the David and Goliath story. Nobody gave David a hope. Nobody said a word about David, that he would ever possibly kill this giant. And yet David, against great odds, but David, with his hand in God's hand, destroyed that which was enormous. And so that is a picture for us of what the church is all about. Now, there are some sermons out, out there that we preach, if you're a preacher. Some sermons you preach in order to teach. There are lessons we need to learn. There are things that we need to study. There are things that we need to know about God and about life and about pretty much everything. There are some sermons that people preach in order to challenge people. When they see things going wrong, somebody's got to stand up and champion the cause of Christ. And that's sometimes a good thing to do. But the most powerful sermon are not the sermons that teach and, and challenge. The most powerful sermons are the sermons that inspire people that you look and say, man, that is incredible. And it's not about being challenged, it's about being inspired. And I'm hoping that today in the simplicity of what I want to share with you, that you'll leave from here inspired to the fact that a little bit can mean a lot when it's put in the hands of God. Now, let's have a look at this on my board over here. Uh, I'm trying to paint a, a picture for you of what this looks like. So I go back to our trusty triangle. 
And there's just five areas that I want to talk about the impact of the yeast. First of all, I want to talk about the global impact. We spoke a little bit about that already. The global impact of the church. And the global impact of the church is found in the fact that the church is something that the world needs. The world is not going to be impacted by a group of people who are irrelevant. The world is not going to be impacted by people who just blow sunshine in everybody's faces. The world is going to be impacted by being able to give them the thing that they need. And we have what the world needs. You know what that is? Amongst the many things that the world needs, the world needs one thing amongst all else. It needs good news. It needs good news. There's so much bad news out there, both short-term, long-term, you know, medium-term. There's, there's bad news all over the place. But the church breathes into this global situation, and it brings with us the wonder of good news. That's why I love when the angel came to the shepherds on the field and in, in the book of Luke, and, and he, he said to them, he said, you guys, in Luke chapter 2, he said, do not be afraid. I bring you good news. There will be for all people that in the little town of Bethlehem will be born a Savior, a man. Now you're thinking to yourself, man, if that was me, I'm thinking, is that good news? One man? What's one man going to do in the context of a messed up world? What is one man going to do to save the world? What is one man in the context of millions? What is one man? Oh, but you just don't know who that one man was and is. And when the angels came, they came and they said, we bring you good news. There is a man. Well, he's a, he's a boy at the moment. In fact, he's not just a boy, he's a baby at the moment. But that baby will grow to become a man and he will become the savior of the world. And the world is saying, that's good news. If that is true, then that is really good news. And then when Jesus left the planet after he had done his thing, crucified and risen and then ascending to heaven, he says to his disciples, go and tell everybody the good news. Go to the world and tell them what has happened. Tell them who I am and bring to them the good news. I'm putting it into your hands. And so the church above all else, above everything else that the church should be doing, and there are many things, we are the bearers of of good news in a global situation. How's the world going to hear about the good news unless we tell them? How's the world going to hear about the good news unless we, we do the things that we're meant to be doing? Galatians chapter 5 verse 9, it says this, a little bit of leaven can influence a huge outcome. Now, when we're looking to save the world, we would all look for talented people, gifted people. We'd be looking for huge armies to get out there and destroy this, the, the sin that is around us and let's do life properly. But, but God did not do that. He doesn't do that at all. He chooses just one man and it breaks every concept of logic. It breaks every concept of, of it. It almost sounds like an irony that one man can have such a great influence. But people... History has proven it to be true. A little bit of yeast, good yeast, can leaven the whole loaf. And that's what the good news has done. Let's take it a step down. We go from a global context to a church context. We've already mentioned a few things about the church, have we not? But here's what God says. God is not impressed with a big church. You do know that. God is impressed with a strategically valuable church, a church that lives. You know, Jesus was never impressed with numbers. The church today has been so, be so conscious of numbers. How many people come to the church? Like, we don't really care. We just want to know that who is the, the small group of people who are deeply committed, who come in from the outside, from the community, into the crowd that is the church, into those who celebrate Jesus, into those who become committed, into those who become the core. And Jesus says, that's what interests me. Jesus was often saying tough things to people when they were in the crowd. Take up your cross and follow me. And he was like, what? Take up my cross and follow you? You mean I've got to die? Jesus said, yep, you've got to die. They all thought he meant he had to die physically. He wasn't saying that. But the tough talk that Jesus said, unless you eat and drink of my flesh and my blood, you will never have any part of me. And the people say, what? Is this like a cannibalism thing? What is this? And many left from following Jesus that day. Jesus does not do church like us. Jesus was not impressed with the crowd. He said, let's find the men from the boys here. Let's see if you can suck this one up. <laughs> 
And he hit them with those amazingly powerful statements. And people slowly said, it's a bit tough for me here. I think I'm going to sneak out of here. And before long, who was left? Just the hard core. In the Old Testament, if you wanted a name for the hard core, you would have called them the remnant. You see, over the course of time, in the Old Testament, God ordained that there would be a nation called Israel who would be his redemptive agent for the world. It didn't make them particularly any better than anybody else. They were just normal human beings, but they were designated by God to be the carriers of good news, to be the bringers of Jesus into the world. That's what the Jewish people, were, the, the nation of Israel was at that particular time. And when, and when, they, and when they, they messed up and they sinned and God had to, had to deal with their sinfulness, he always left a remnant And the people would have thought, man, the Jews have been wiped out. There's nothing left of them. But there was always a remnant left. And God said, out of that remnant, out of that little seed, I will grow my kingdom again. And he did. And as that kingdom grew and then somebody messed it up and the kingdom sinned and they went back to start, God just smiled and said, not a problem. It's not a problem. You see over there, amongst all those who have, who have rejected me and all those that have gone from me, there is still a remnant there. And I'm trusting that remnant. I'm going to plant that remnant. I'm going to grow that remnant. And my church is going to explode once again. There is a remnant. And that is the church. So do not think for a moment that the church needs to be, that everybody in the country needs to become a Christian in order for the church to show its effectiveness. It would be great if everybody became a Christian, but we don't need that. God does not need that. He just needs a remnant of people to be faithful followers of Jesus. That's all he needs to grow his kingdom. And so the church is kind of like a picture. People have tried to persecute it. People have tried to wipe out the church as they have the Jewish people, and they just keep bouncing back. You see, that's such a cool thing. I love the, the, the little illustration of uh, the five loaves and the two fish. Here's this kid comes to Jesus. He hears Jesus say to his disciples, guys, there's 5,000 people here. They've been here for a couple of days. They haven't eaten anything. Will you please feed them? <laughs> and some of them Jesus, yeah, yeah, Jesus, there's no shops nearby here. And we'd have to pay a year and a half's wage to be able to just give them one little bit of a meal. Jesus, this is impossible. A little boy hears that and says, Hey, Jesus, you want my lunch? Here's my five little loaves and my two little fish. Jesus, is there anything you can do? I know it's only a little, but if I put this little into your hands, Jesus, I'm pretty sure you could make a lot of it. And so Jesus smiles and said, here's a remnant in the crowd who's giving me a remnant of his breakfast. And from one remnant to another remnant, I can feed the crowd. So he says to his disciples, take those few, those few loaves and fish and, and go and break that amongst the people. Still, the disciples were cynics and skeptics, but they did it. And they kept breaking. And they kept breaking the bread. And they kept breaking the fish until all thousands of men, there must have been a whole lot more, counting the women and the kids, were fed out of a remnant. Just a little portion. It illustrates to us the principle a little bit of yeast in the right hands can go a long way. Now notice, in, not in my hands. You put a few loaves of fish in my hands, I'm, I'm just going to probably eat it for breakfast. But uh, you put it in Jesus' hands and he's feeding 5,000 people. It's kind of like if you wanted a stupid illustration, it's kind of like a tennis racket. If you put a tennis racket in my hand, oh, we could have a little bit of fun on the tennis court, but, but you put a, uh, put a tennis racket into, into Roger Federer's hands, you've got a Wimbledon champion five times over. And it all depends on whose hands it's in. If it's in my hands, we're not going anywhere other than have a little Sunday, Sunday run around a tennis court. Take a golf club. You put a golf club in Gary Brackley's hands, and you, you've got a hole in one. He does have a hole in one, apparently. I believe he has. If you put a golf club in his hands, you could possibly, he's a hole in one, man. You know, put it in my hand. You're going to walk for a week, pal. You know, because I'm, but put it in the right, it all depends on whose hands it's in. So when you put a little, like that little kids, little loaves and fish into the hands of Jesus and say, Jesus, I know it's not much. It's all I've got. But Jesus, I think you could do something with this. And when you put a little into his hands, 
you know the result. A little bit of yeast can come make a huge influence for a lot when it's in the right hands. I would like to believe that the church is in the right hands. And he's not impressed with numbers. He just needs a remnant to make his kingdom work. Let's move on. It's the third one here. We're scaling down from a global to a personal place over here. We'll get there in a ministry. Many minute. This one is your ministry. This is really your calling in life. You do know that every one of you has a calling. And our callings are pretty much mostly different. But God has shaped you uniquely for a very special purpose. I have my little calling. So too do you. And God has shaped you for that. We read in Ephesians how that he prepared you before you were even born. God prepared you for the good works that he hoped that one day you would do. He did it before you were even born. You and he, you, he, was just, he was just dreaming. And God dreamt up a you. And he says, I'm going to make this person like this. I'm going to create this person with these gifts and abilities. And he could do that. You know why he could do that? Is because he's God. There's nothing he cannot do. Incredible, isn't it? That God is able to do that. Psalm 139, we speak about so often, that you were knit together in your mother's womb, and God knew you before you were even born, before you were even conceived. You say, what kind of a God can do that? Well, apparently our God is able to do just that. And then we're born, and we go through life forgetting what our purpose is, until one day, one thing happens, in many people's case. You arrive at a burning bush experience. That's what Moses did. I'm using him to illustrate this point. He was drifting through life. He was born as a, as a reject, taken into Pharaoh's palace, put the silver spoon in his mouth. He had everything. He was destined to be a great man. He messed up. He was sent to the wilderness. He ran to the wilderness in fear of his life. And he married someone. Then he, he, learned, he worked for his father-in-law as a shepherd in a stinking desert for 40 years. And he thought, that's it. I'm done. I'm 80 years old now, and there's no more hope for me until one day something, one incident happened in his life that was yeast. And this yeast just burst in front of him as he saw the burning bush. He heard the voice of God saying, Moses, you and I need to talk. You're on holy ground. Take off your shoes. He takes his shoes off. He falls on his face and says, oh, Lord, who are you? And God introduces himself and says, Moses, I have chosen you. From the beginning of time, Moses, chosen you. I knew that you would get to this time in your life when you'd be dry and disillusioned. But Moses, do not fear. I've chosen you. And Moses is trembling. He says, Lord, what, what, what do you want me to do? I'm nobody. I'm useless. I'm a wanted man back in Egypt. I murdered somebody there. And now I've been in this desert for 40 years. Lord, I can do nothing. And he says that God said to him, he said, Moses, can you speak? And Moses said, oh, I was hoping you were going to ask that because that's the last thing I want to do. God, don't you know that I stutter? Don't you know that I have a speech impediment? Don't you know that I cannot possibly be used of you if it's got anything to standing up in front of people to speak? Lord, you've got the wrong man. <laughs> Find somebody else who can do that. And God said, no, no, Moses, stop arguing. You're the man. And then he reminds Moses, says, Moses, argues with him with all sorts of excuses as to why he can't be God's man and fulfill the purpose that God has called him to. And God said, Moses, I'm kind of tired of negotiating with you now. Moses, who put that tongue in your head? It's a good question. That one question changed his life. Moses, who put that tongue in your head? And he looks and he said, well, I guess you did. He says, well, if I put that tongue in your head, can I not give you the words to speak? And Moses was silent. One question at one burning bush, one answer, and Moses was a different person. And out of the yeast of that sowing of that seed in Moses' mind grew one of the greatest men that has ever lived. And that yeast that was once so small, a little bit of yeast, you know, when it grows, can become a great influence for many things. Moses was that. A little bit of yeast can influence an incredible 
whole outcome. So don't ever, people, don't ever come to God with an issue over your calling because you'll have the same conversation. God's going to say, who are you arguing with? I created you. I know exactly what you're able to do and what you can and cannot do. And when you do the possible, I'll do the impossible. You just trust me with those things. So if God, and he, he has to be. If this is true, people, there's a calling on all of your lives. First calling is the call to salvation. God says, you want to be saved? Come to me, and I will take away your sin. I'll clear, clear the record between you and me, and we, then we can get on with the job. And then you're calling, and it doesn't matter whatever. You guys need to get to Mike, Mike and Irene's gift seminar on a Thursday night. He's talking about the gifts that God has given to the church to be a blessing to the church. You all have them. And there's only 30 people there. Where are you all? And I would suggest you need to go and find If that is true, Trevor, then I need to find out what God's calling on me, what God's purpose on me is. And if there's room there, I need to try and get myself over there because I need to be a part of that. God has called you people to more than just warm up here on a Sunday morning. He's called you to fulfill a purpose for his kingdom. And a little that you think you have to offer can, in the hands of God, become something that will leaven the entire loaf. Man, you kids sitting down here, listen carefully. I wish somebody had just told me these things when I was much younger. This is where you guys are at. Chad is doing such a great job of raising up leaders and encouraging you. A little bit of leaven can lead and leaven the entire loaf. The entire loaf is this, what we renounce, the church. And it's in your hands. Do something with it, you guys. Do something for goodness sake. Let's talk about the next level down. Let's talk about, we've spoken about globally, we're moving down into the church, into our ministry. Let's talk about making this more personal by talking about relationships. Relationships. We're all in relationship with somebody or something, and these relationships can sometimes become toxic in our lives. Have a look at Genesis 31, two great heroes of the Old Testament. They were twin brothers. Jacob and Esau. And Jacob ripped off Esau and stole his birthright. You know the story, I'm sure. Ran off because Esau was a mean guy. And me, Esau was, was after him. And Esau spent years trying to get to his brother because he ripped him off of his birthright. And there was years of conflict, years of fear, years of animosity. And it was all because of one problem. The yeast of one problem had got into their relationship. And this yeast was blowing up and making everything so much bigger. It was a wicked, wicked yeast of evil. And it got into their relationship and blew it up until they couldn't sleep at night. And Jacob was, was, was a miserable codger and Esau was angry as anything until one day one of them decided, I'm going to sow some good yeast and I'm going to eat my pride I'm going to deplete the impact of pride in the loaf, and I'm going to sow some good yeast. And you know what it was? <laughs> I'm going to go and ask for forgiveness. I'm just going to go out and say, man, hey, Esau, I know you're angry with me. I know you want to kill me. I want to acknowledge that I didn't do well, and Esau, hopefully, because he didn't do well either. You know, there's generally two stories to these things and two sides to them. And, and, and Jacob, who could take it no longer, went and found his twin brother Esau, and they, they made up. He slept well those next few nights and thereafter. There was no more animosity, no more looking over his shoulder to see if his brother was there. He was at total peace. And the sense of well-being, I'm sure, was totally overwhelming. When relationships go wrong, it generally goes wrong because somebody's pride has been hurt. That's what happened. That one thing of pride, just, just, just pride alone, and ego, and you stood on my pride, you've trampled my ego, and I'm angry, and I'm sensitive, and I'm prickly like a porcupine now, because I'm proud. But when somebody says, man, eat your pride, I'm telling you, eat your pride. And the only way you do that is to humble yourself. Go and find that person that you have hurt or has hurt you, and ask for forgiveness or forgive, one of the two things. And watch what happens in the realm of 
relationships, that one act, and it's just one act. You don't have to go for counseling for five years to do this thing. You don't have to go on a seminar, read 25 books in order to do one thing. Forgive and be forgiven. And watch. <laughs> you say, this is not be that simple. I'm telling you people, it's that simple. Let's do one more. Let's go down into the realm of you. We started up here with a global thing, but the global thing only operates because there's lots of yous around. And so we're now on a personal sort of a, an issue. And I want to take a few minutes just to make this appropriate for you. Hopefully this makes sense. In a world that is so messed up, you are part of this world, are you not? In a world that is such a, a tragic situation, we're not immune to tragedy. So many people who think they become, will become Christians are confused. They don't know. And this was a, the preacher never told me that I would be, be, have tragedy in my life. The, teacher never told, the preacher never told me that I would, have, I would maybe suffer trauma in my life. The preacher never told me I'd have trouble or testing or, or temptation or, or whatever. He never told me those things. And yet because we are human, we all suffer, do we not? The suffering of humanity is for everybody, believers as well. We all get sick. We pray for God's healing and sometimes God is so gracious and he gives it to us. But because of all the tragedy and the trauma and the trouble, sometimes in our lives we get to the point where we're running on empty. We're just hopeless. No hope before us. No hope around us. No hope within us. And I guess we can identify very well with Elijah, that prophet in 1 Kings. The prophet who, who brought down fire from heaven and then went into a state of, state of deep depression. And he runs off into the wilderness, he finds a tree, and he falls asleep in front of the tree, underneath this tree, and he, he's in the desert, and an angel comes and says to him, wakes him up and says, what are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah says, I'm miserable, go away. He's in a state of deep, probably post-adrenal depression, and he's there, and the angel said, well, no, no, don't go away. I brought you something to eat. Yeah, you must eat this and then have a sleep. So Elijah eats, and he has a sleep. He felt a whole lot better. If you're feeling miserable and depressed, maybe you need to do the same thing. Or maybe some of us need to eat less and exercise more. But uh, you know what I mean? You've got to look after yourself, basically. We've got a whole sermon about that kind of stuff too, so I don't often preach. But, but we, could, we could make a big deal of that. But the angels just said, no, it's okay, Elisha. Elijah, just, just put your head down and have a nap, eat this thing, and have a sleep. And then he wakes up and he says, get up into this cave. I want to meet you there. He gives him more food and a drink. He walks for 40 days to this cave. And uh, the angel finds him there. And he experiences God like he's never experienced God before. God came to speak to him, not with the thunder and lightning of rocks and wind and fire and earthquakes, which he experienced on the mountain, but in the still small voice of intimate fellowship. Have you ever heard that voice? If you're in a state, a miserable state right now, Todd is going to be practical. If you're in a miserable state of, of, of depression or whatever, I'm not taking away anything else from all the other things you need. There are two things you need to do. First one is you need to experience the intimate voice of God. For goodness sake, people, we're Christians. We believe that God speaks to us. He has different ways of doing that. But I need to ask you, have you, when last did you hear the voice of God? Maybe you need to find a little cave and let God speak to you there. The second thing you need to do is very practical. Just go and find a friend. <laughs> find a friend. The reason you're lonely is because you haven't made any effort. Go and find a friend. And Elijah's cried out to God, God, I'm the only one left. There's no other prophet like me. And God said, get over yourself, Elijah. There's 700 other, 7,000 other people who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Go and find yourself a friend. And so in the very next chapter, we read how Elijah says, I'll go and find one. He's walking across the field one day. He sees a guy called Elisha. He says, hey, you look like you could be a good friend. Do you want to be my friend? And he finds himself a friend. And the restoration of sharing life with a friend is so important. If you want a friend, go and find one. There are lots of people who would love to be your friend. Go and find one. This is simple stuff. And the problems of life, when you share them 
with a friend are just so much better. So the first one is find someone. The second aspect of this dealing with the problems of life is someone needs to find you. Someone needs to find you. I'm not talking about Jesus here. I'm talking about human flesh. And God has agents of encouragement around the place. I have experienced over the course of time many of them. Not many have become big buddies with me, but at certain times in my life, and I'm sure you're all, you nod your head, there comes somebody into your life who just does something and he helps you to carry your burdens, kind of like, huge example, Jesus on the way to the cross. He's been beaten. He's lost so much blood and he's carrying this heavy cross and he's battling up the hill to, of Calvary where they will crucify him. And they see him battling and they call a guy called Simon of Cyrene. He doesn't even come from that area. He comes from Africa. And they call Simon and said, hey, you, get over here and help him to carry his cross. And if you've ever seen the movie, you know, I forget what it's called now. You know the one I mean. You'll look at Jesus' eyes when Simon steps forward to help him to carry his cross. Eyes full of gratitude to say, hey, thanks, buddy. Thanks for helping me. Thanks for helping me to carry the burden that I have to carry. And generally, it's somebody who you never expected it to be. Be on the lookout for those people. Somebody needs to find you. A little bit of yeast in your life can influence the whole loaf. Let me just give you one last example. What about John chapter 20? You have Mary, a picture of total hopelessness. Mary Magdalene is in the garden after the crucifixion of Jesus, and he's dead. Grave has been, he's been put in the grave. She gets there, she can't find him. The gravestone has been moved away. And she's sitting outside and she's crying. And the gardener comes to her and says, Mary, why are you crying? And she said, oh, they've taken him away. If you know where they've taken him, please tell me. And then there's a silence, this pregnant pause as she's weeping. And then Jesus just calls her name and says, hey, Mary, Mary. That one thing, Jesus calling her name, was the leaven that changed the expected outcome of the situation she was in. Hopelessness was gone when she heard him call her name. Are you saying, man, Trevor, you know, is it, does it have to be this touchy-feely? Yeah, it does. Do you know, people, how personal God is? Man, he loves you, man. He loves you enough to get under your burden, to help you carry it. He loves you enough to want to be your friend and your companion in life. And he loves you so much that he knows your name. And when you're going through these tough things, listen for the call from him of your name. That little yeast, just that one thing, can leaven the entire loaf of your life. So this leaven deal, it's global. The church is the influence. The church is the remnant. Our ministry, don't argue with God. He's put the tongue in your mouth kind of thing. The relationships, forgiveness, goodness, let go of your pride. If you need to apologize, you need to make right for goodness sake, go and do it. And then you, he wants you to know that he knows your name. He knows where you are. And he would love to be a part of your life. We're about to have communion. I'm finished. And uh, we're going to commemorate, we're going to celebrate the death of this one man. And I love that verse 1 Corinthians 15 verse 21 says this, For since death came into the world through one man, that was Adam in the garden, so too the resurrection of the dead comes through one man, that is Jesus. The power of one man, that little bit of yeast to leaven the entire loaf of sin and your future and your life. As we take and celebrate communion today because of one man, just one man, but man, what a man. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today and the simple word. I'm not sure I've explained it all that well, but I think we've got the idea that your life changed everything. 
It changes globally that the world will never be the same again since you came. It never has been and never will be. Thank you for the role of the church that you've put into our hands, the good news of salvation. Thank you, Lord, that in our own lives we can understand the beauty of ministry and be able to and you be empowered by, by you to take the little that we have and put it into the hand of God and you miraculously turn it into a lot. We don't, you do, when we give you what we have. Lord, if there are people here today who are just messing up with relationships, and I don't, don't want to oversimplify this thing because we're complicated people, but I pray, Lord, that they would understand the beauty of humility, just plain humility. Thank you that you love us. In Jesus' name, amen.